Jana Shalakaya Chatsuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shremati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nevisesha Shunyavari Paschacha Desatarine Vancha Kaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Avane Pyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namo Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadhi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare So it's my very good fortune to be here with you this afternoon. I'm very happy to see all of you young men taking an active interest in Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada was sometimes asked, why is it our movement attracts so many young people. And Prabhupada told the reporters, he said, he said, because when young, when the youth, that is the time for education. So this Krishna consciousness movement is actually meant for education, real education. Every country in the world, they will make budgets how to spend their finances and one of the major parts of the expenses of every country in the world is for education to provide colleges and universities and schools and so on unfortunately the most valuable part of education is neglected and they simply focus on material knowledge, knowledge of matter and chemicals, the knowledge of the body. They don't give the real education which is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna describes the, in the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Rajavidya, mm -hmm. the king of knowledge. It's meant for kings, actually. This knowledge is meant for the kings. Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam. It's confidential knowledge. Confidential, actually, it's meant for everyone, but not everyone's able to appreciate this knowledge. That is the problem. People are generally conditioned to material life and they think only about enjoying naturally the na everyone's nature is we want to enjoy now I was sitting in the next room and I could hear your kirtan and I could hear the I could feel the spiritual energy coming from your loud kirtan and I was giving a class on Zoom to people in Europe and they were hearing the kirtan and they were surprised and they said, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> and one, one lady said to me, she said, what, what temple is this you're in? <laughs> they were amazed, you know, they were also accustomed to going to temples in Europe like that in one lady was from Zurich in Switzerland and others were from the UK so it was quite interesting to see how they were they were really just astonished <laughs> to hear you know that the, the loud energetic chanting of the devotees and so Thank you very much for that. And I was very happy to tell her that I'm in Atarpur and there's a wonderful temple here and it's very nice. <laughs> you must come sometime. <laughs> so, so maybe more and more 
you know what? More and more people will be coming <laughs> to visit your temple here just to hear the nice kirtan, the loud, energetic enthusiasm. We want to understand the importance of <coughs> making use of our youth to develop the good spiritual knowledge, to understand something about what is the value of life. We generally are misled into thinking that life means simply work hard, make a lot of money, and you're a success. It's not really true like that. To think, you know, just because you work hard and you make a lot of money, your life is a success. And, you know, if you become a dog in the next life, it's not a success. We have to be philosophical and we have to think about the purpose of life. Why are we here and where are we going? And we can also reflect on where have we come from? What, how did we get into this condition which we are in today? So in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna guides us and he gives us answers to all of these questions. And all of you, you are the youth of your country. So every country values greatly their youth because the youth are the future of the nation. And it's the you people in the future will become the leaders of the nation. And we want to see that you all have the, prop, have the opportunity to get the knowledge of Krishna consciousness to understand fully the value of this human life. You have the good fortune to be born in Bharatvars, right? Bharatvars. Uh, previously the whole planet was known as Bharatvars. But generally we, we speak specifically of what we call India as Bharatvars. And it, it's a we would call it also Punya Bhumi, the land of piety, where people are full of virtue, good qualities. So it's a very good fortune to take birth in this kind of place. The good fortune is that you can understand immediately about the value of religion, and worship of God. Just yesterday, I was walking. I was taken for a walk around this area, and I saw how so many temples are there. There's a Rama temple, and there's a Gaja Lakshmi temple, and there's a Shiva temple, and there were so many temples there, all in this one area around here. And that's an indication about the nature of this place, that there's a lot of piety here, that people are generally pious and religious, and they do think about God, they think about religion. We have to understand how to apply religion in our own life. It has to be practical. Krishna consciousness is the most practical way of life. We learn from our Krishna consciousness movement how to combine material life with spiritual life. Just like I myself, you know, when I came to the Krishna consciousness movement, I was your age. I was 21. I just graduated from university. I studied in the UK. I graduated in engineering. And I was working in a job in London. And I met the devotee. I, I, I purchased a book of Srila Prabhupada. So I took the book home 
It was a book called Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And it was a very attractive book. I was immediately attracted to the book. It was a beautiful color picture and inside the book there were many other colored plates and I was just really fascinated by the book and because I was working, I had a job, I was earning money so I thought let me buy the book so I purchased the book and took it home showed it to my friend and he said oh I have a book by the same person so he got out his book, he had a book called The Topmost Yoga System and so we were very impressed to see this the different books, they were quite different in nature one was a big book with color pictures, the other was a small book, black and white, about yoga. And so I thought we have to check, I have to find out more. So I began to read the book. You know, I've been reading books by many other spiritual teachers. There were many different teachers, diff books by so many thinkers and philosophers. I used to read different books. I was a seeker. I was looking for knowledge, trying to understand something more about the meaning of life. Because nobody could ever give me any real satisfactory answers whenever I would inquire. But I read Prabhupada's book and I felt it was the best book I'd ever read. It was just a small book, but I thought everything said there made perfect sense. And then I began to chant Hare Krishna. And I also started to go to visit the temple. I was fortunate because devotees had come from USA. They had come to London and they'd opened a small center there. So I began to visit the center there and I was surprised to see young people like that time I was 21 some of the people there were younger than me they were like teenagers and some were a little older and they were all British they were all young Englishmen there was one Indian bodied man one Indian man he joined also he had actually came from Calcutta, he was a Bengali, and he came from Calcutta, he came to London to study. He told me, he said his parents sent him to London to study, because when he was in India, he was getting a, too close and too much association with sadhus. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know going to some different temples and so on so his parents were worried about him so they sent him to London for education and he meant Hare Krishna <laughs> <laughs> and he's still a devotee maybe you've met him he comes here sometimes Subhag Swami did he come here no you don't know Subhag Swami anyway he's an active devotee one of the active spiritual teachers uh, he's still traveling around and preaching here in India just now he's in Indonesia preaching there but he, you know, he's pretty much based in Calcutta, Mayapur and he does sometimes come to Andhra also down, down here Telagano and like this, this area so I'll tell him also, you should come and visit here. <laughs> but he's a very nice devotee. So he was there, he joined the movement and we were, we were only a few, there were not many devotees in those days. It was a new society. There were about 18 people staying in the center. And uh, we had Radha Krishna deities. Srila Prabhupada had arranged by some miracle that there were some Radha Krishna deities which people donated for our temple and so those deities are still being worshipped today 
their big size Radha and Krishna deities. So we have a nice temple there in London. So I started to go there and I was visiting regularly and I was going to the classes and hearing Bhagavad Gita. Now, previously I'd heard about Bhagavad Gita. When I was studying at college, we had to take some course on humanities. And one of the subjects was the Bhagavad Gita. And it was taught by a Christian minister, a priest in the Christian church. And so I didn't understand anything he was talking about, you know. I really didn't know much about it at all. But later on, when I started to visit Hare Krishna temple, then every evening they would have Bhagavad Gita class. And I appreciated the classes given then by the devotees, the young devotees. So I used to enjoy hearing the classes and I would ask questions. So the devotees told me, they say, you know, you can stay overnight here and go to work in the morning. Because I had a job, I was working, I just finished college and I had my job. So I said, I have to work. They said, it's all right, you stay here overnight and you can, we'll give you some breakfast and you can go to work. So I thought, all right, I'll try it out. So I started to stay in the center. I'd wake up early and go to the Mongol RT. And then we would also chant Japa. And then I, you know, a little later I'd go off to work. And I'd come home in the evening and the devotees would keep me prasadam in the evening. So I was doing like that. Every evening I'd be there for the RT and we would enjoy the kirtan and hear the Bhagavad Gita lectures and this way I, I was appreciating the temple atmosphere so then the devotee, one devotee said to me, he said you, you can give up that job you don't need to go to that job anymore just give up that job, Just you can work here we need you here, you should be here there's so many things to be done in the temple so better you stay here in the daytime instead of going to work. And so I thought, why not? <laughs> so I gave up the job. Because you can always get another job, right? There's always so many jobs, you know. Just a job. So I gave up the job, became full-time devotee. And then <laughs> began to help the devotees. In those days, we did not have many people to support our temple and we would make incense we would manufacture our own incense and we would manufacture it and then put it in a nice packet with a picture of Krishna on the packet and we would sell it in the shops you know we were like manufacturers and wholesalers <laughs> and we would put it into the, the shops and they would sell it and in this way we were able to support the temple. And we would put on festivals like Rati Atra and then Janmastami and so on. Now in India there's quite a big population of Hindu. So when we have festivals, people will come. But there's also other temples. There's many temples there in England. Hindu temples, different places. So sometimes when Prabhupada would come, they would invite Prabhupada to come to their temples to give lecture. And we would go with Prabhupada and we would accompany Prabhupada and Prabhupada would give the class to them and talk to them and tell them that we're trying to establish a Krishna Conscious Center here. You should all help us like that. Prabhupada would encourage the people that you should all help these young men. <laughs> right? Prabhupada was elderly. He was over 70s. But he was asking the people, the Indian people who had come there to the England, you kindly help these young men that they have given up everything to take this Krishna consciousness movement to establish this Krishna Consciousness Movement. 
So Prabhupada wanted us to establish the Krishna consciousness movement not only in the UK but all over the world. Now at that time there were not many temples in India. In fact there were, <laughs> there were hardly any temples in India. And Prabhupada had began the Krishna conscious movement in America and then it came to UK and then Prabhupada wanted to bring devotees to India to establish the temples in India. So Prabhupada took away all the leader, all the senior devotees, he brought them with him to India. And they came to India and they established some temples here. First, um, we had rented. Well, first the devotees were just traveling. They would just travel around in the train from one place to another to different programs. People would invite Prabhupada. And sometimes they would go up to Amritsa. Next moment they'd go down to Chennai. Another time they'd go over to Mumbai. Like that, they were moving everywhere. And went to Surat, a big, a big program in Surat. And devotees were traveling around doing program. But Prabhupada wanted to establish centers. So in 1971 or 72, Mr. Pularedi here in Hyderabad, he donated the land at Abbots. And we got the center there at Abbots. So that was very encouraging that Mr. Pularedi donated the land there. And Prabhupada sent some of the devotees, they went there and they came to Hyderabad. That time there was a drought in Hyderabad. There was no water and everybody was in difficulties. The economy was very bad. You know, Indira Gandhi, you, of course you were not all oh, not born, right? <laughs> you, you don't know. You were in another body. <laughs> You were maybe an old woman. Or a <laughs> now you're young men, but in your previous life, while we were establishing the temple there at Abbots in 1970s, you were in a different body, right? <laughs> we won't say what body you were in, but we know somewhere you were, right? So we had to establish the temple there, very difficult times because even to get cement was difficult and we had no books, we could not get paper easily to print the books. It was very difficult. We were just beginning the Krishna consciousness movement. But you can see how different it is today. At one point even, 1978, I was made the temple president of the abbot's temple. No, I didn't do very good. <laughs> it's very difficult to run a temple, I can tell you. It's a big responsibility, very difficult. So they built the temple, but we didn't have money to finish it. And there was, there was no door on the temple. <laughs> so I used to sleep in the doorway <laughs> because there was no, we had no money to put the door on the temple, you see. So I was sleeping there in the doorway at night. Anyway, like that, it was quite, it was the beginning of our Krishna consciousness movement. We began like that. Prabhupada also, he went to America no money. He did not have any money. He went to America, he had 40 rupees. <laughs> and then he brought, he printed some books, Bhagavatam, and he took some crates of those books with him. So when the captain on the ship, Prabhupada went to America by ship. So the captain of the ship, he was a captain Pandya. So Prabhupada asked him, can you purchase one set of my books? So the captain saw the books and he bought one set 
and he gave Prabhupada $20. Prabhupada said $20 is a few hours spending in New York. Is it easy you can spend 20 Even in 1960s, $20 would go quickly. But that was the only money Prabhupada had. He went to America like that. He did not go to get money. He didn't think about, I'll make money here. He, he came, he went to America to give. He brought his books there to give the knowledge, to give the wisdom, to give the culture. He gave everything. He taught the devotees how to cook. He taught them how to make all the different, Prabhupada himself was expert cook. And he would make all the different Indian, Bengali sweets and different dishes. He could make everything very nicely, he trained the devotee. He was expert Madanga player, taught the devotees how to play Madanga and every, taught how to worship the deity. So everything we learned from Prabhupada personally in the beginning. So Prabhupada taught some devotees and then some other devotees would teach other devotees. In this way everything spread. So now you can see the result here in Hyderabad. We have very nice temples. I was over at Abbot's yesterday morning. I was amazed to see how the temple has developed from when I was there in 78. It looks so wonderful, so magnificent. In the beginning we had everything just basic. But because it's spiritual, everything is dynamic, it's improving all the time, you see. That is the proof that this is a genuine process, that more and more people are appreciating and benefiting from Krishna consciousness, from the education, from the knowledge which they get in serving Krishna. So we want to encourage all of you that while you're in your youth, you want to make the best use of your time to also cultivate Krishna consciousness. Don't waste this opportunity. It's very rare and we're very fortunate to have this opportunity. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita it is described Brahmanda Brahmite Kunya Bhagyavan Jeev Guru Krishna Prasade Pai Bhukti Lata Beej That we have been moving through many different universes Brahmanandas, we are moving through these different universes in different species of life, different bodies Now somehow we have come to this human form of life and you are here in this land of Bharat Vars and you have the opportunity to, con to cultivate the seed of devotion, the Bhakti Lata Beach, right? The seed of Bhakti, it has been planted into your hearts by all the devotees here in this temple and around Hyderabad you have contacted the Krishna Consciousness Movement and they have given you that seed of bhakti. Now, you, that means you are very fortunate. Hmm. Guru Krishna Prasadi by Bhakti Lata Beach. Hmm. Konya Bhagavan Jeev. Very fortunate living entities. Only very fortunate living entities get this opportunity to receive that seed of devotion into the heart. Now that seed is there in the heart, you have to cultivate it. You have to water it nicely. Just like if we do some farming, planting seeds, you have to water. You have to make sure you get enough water for the seeds to grow. 
So this bhakti seed of devotion is there and it's in the heart and it needs also proper watering. And the watering process is based on hearing and chanting. That shravanam and kirtan. These two things are very, very important for us to allow that seed to fructify and to germinate and to grow and to sprout up and to produce a creeper and that creeper grows and grows and it meant to grow right out of this world through the coverings of the universe and go into the spiritual world. It's meant to enter right into the spiritual sky and it's meant to go and take shelter at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. And then you still have to go on watering because we have to get the fruit from that seed. And that fruit which comes from that seed, the seed of bhakti, that fruit is called prema. Bhakti, prema bhakti, love of God. You get that. That is the goal of life, ultimately, to get that thing. That is the most precious, the most valuable thing. So you want, we want to try to cultivate that. Of course, not immediately. It's going to take time. It's going to take some practice. So here in devotion, in the path of devotional service, we learn first of all to do what is called sadhana bhakti. Sadhana bhakti. Devotional service in practice. Practice is very important. Just like if you're driving a car, you have to practice. You don't drive perfectly immediately, you have to practice. Or if you're a cook, you have to practice cooking. Or if you're typing using the computer, you have to practice. You don't know the keys, you, you have to learn, you have to practice. So we also have to practice cultivating this devotion, this attachment or this love which we all have, which is there for Krishna. The person who, we're at, who we actually care about more than anybody else is Krishna. We don't, we're not aware of that, but it's a fact that the person who we really care more than anybody about is Krishna. Nobody loves a dead body. The body's dead. Are you going to embrace it? Are you going to keep it with you forever? The body's dead. We burn it. Get rid of it. So, why? Because the valuable part of the body, what was the living part of the body, is gone. What was the real life in the body? The soul, right? When the soul leaves the body, then the body is no good anymore. We get rid of it. And that valuable part of the body, that soul, that is actually a part of Krishna. There are two souls within our body. There is the living entity, and there is a super soul. There is a Jeev Atma, which is the living entity, and there is a Paramatma, the super soul. So they're together, like two birds in the tree. But at the time of death, they leave the body. The super soul accompanies the Jiva, and we go, we'll take another body. We give up one body, we take another body. Death is simply the change of body. It's not something which we have to be very much concerned about. It's just part of the nature of the material world. That we take a body and that body is going to die one day. But we want to make the best use of this body while we have it. So we have to chant, we have to hear, we have to do this bhakti, the devotional service in practice. 
we have to practice every day chanting right we're going we have to how many of you are chanting yes oh so many of you very good yes you need to of course we have to practice this chanting it's not that we just chant one day and immediately it's perfect we have to practice and keep chanting regularly and the more we chant then the more we will want to chant that's the nature of this chanting process it becomes very infectious we become attracted more and more to the chanting and we want to do it more and more so we have to chant and we have to also hear we have to hear from books like the Bhagavad Gita the Srimad Bhagavatam and we have to come to the temple and see the deities to see the Lord in the temple just by coming to the temple and seeing the deities and bowing down before them then we're making spiritual advancement and we're getting rid of a lot of sins from the past before we came here we did a lot of bad things maybe you took things which were not vegetarian maybe you did things like you smoking cigarettes or drinking tea and coffee watching horrible movies we do a lot of nonsense things and they don't do us any good they give us a lot of bad karma they cause us a lot of suffering but by coming to the temple go to the temple and see the deities you get a lot of benefit and you get rid of all these reactions these bad things which are there so we get rid of the the sinful activities and we can do some good things so bhakti yoga is a practice we practice regularly hearing chanting being with devotees is very helpful to have the association of devotees you can see Krishna has arranged a nice temple to come here Hyderabad has become such a big city so many places new buildings new houses everywhere so big but another new Krishna conscious temple so that's a great blessing for the people of Hyderabad that you can all come here regularly and associate and cultivate your Krishna consciousness cultivate that attachment to Krishna which is there within us we're all in relationship to Krishna but we have forgotten Prabhupada said he has come to remind us what we have forgotten so chanting Hare Krishna see the deities take the prasadam like that this way the, the bhakti lata beach that seed in the heart gets watered and as it grows then we will experience more and more the bliss the happiness of Krishna consciousness it is a fact if there is no pleasure there why should we stay in Krishna consciousness I, I came to the Krishna consciousness movement more than 50 years ago in London why did I stay why didn't I go I could have left I could have taken jobs and worked and so on why did I stay in Krishna consciousness because there's more pleasure here there's more enjoyment there's more happiness in this Krishna conscious life than you get in the material world material world it is all 
the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest. You know, people are all fighting with each other, struggling with each other, trying to get success, trying to get position, trying to make some money for themselves. Krishna consciousness, we are simply working for Krishna. We recognize Krishna as the supreme, as the proprietor and we give everything to Krishna and that gives us the greatest happiness. People in the material world are never happy. They're always struggling, working, ch change their job, one job to another job. Sometimes even they change their wife, one <laughs> wife to another wife. They're so unhappy, so miserable. They're trying to be happy. They're trying to find the happiness from the body. But real happiness is in the soul. We want to look within and find the pleasure within all of us. So that is spiritual life. Don't be blinded by this bright lights, you know. Now in Hyderabad, so many bright lights everywhere, you know, so many fast cars and so on. So we can get bewildered, we can become attracted, we can think, oh, the world is nice, I'm happy, I'm enjoying here. But it's very temporary. We have to understand that one day we have to leave this place. So we should be thinking like that. We cultivate material life with the spiritual life. You have to have some spirituality in your life. If it's all material, then you will not be happy. You will not be satisfied. So you need to combine material life with spiritual life. We say train goes on two tracks, right? You're not like Japan. Japan have monorail, <laughs> one track, you know. But in India, train goes on two tracks. And if the tracks are not level, then what will happen? <laughs> right? Overturn. We overturn. The train falls over. The tracks are not level, so it falls over. So we have to balance. You need some spiritual basis to your life. We have to maintain the body, yes. We do have to work, we have to have a job, all right. But we have to also have some time to chant Hare Krishna, time to come to the temple, time to hear and to chant, that's very important. And then, later on in life, as you get older, then you have to focus more on the spiritual side of life. While you are young, you can balance the two, material and spiritual. But as you get older in life, you have to focus more on the spiritual aspect of life. This is the Vedic culture. Vedas describe four ashrams. Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha and Sannyasa. Right? So Brahmacharya here, Brahmacharis, you see the young men, right? They're students, they're studying, young men. They have to study, they have to learn the scriptures, they chant, they learn reading, writing, learn everything. So that's brahmacharya life. And then next phase is grihastha. You get married, you have a wife, you can have a family, right? Krishna consciousness it doesn't forbid that, naturally. Most of the members of our Krishna conscious community are grihasthas. They have their family, 
But there also it's an ashram. It's a spiritual life. There are two kinds of householders. There is the Grehasta and the Grehamedi. Grehamedi means those people who are in the family life who are only envious. They only think about what they have and what they don't have and they're only thinking about you know what they want to get to improve their family life. They're only thinking materially like Dhritarashtra. You know Dhritarashtra from Bhagavad Gita, right? Yes. So Dhritarashtra is speaking about his sons and the sons of Pandu. Dhritarashtra is supposed to take care of the Pandavas, but he only thinks about his sons. He doesn't think about his brother's sons. He makes a distinction, my children and the sons of Pandu. So that's Grihamedi. Grihamedi, they are thinking, we need, I need, our family needs. They don't think about others. So there's Grihamedi and Grihasta. Grihasta is a spiritual ashram. It's a Grihasta ashram. Ashram means a shelter, a place of shelter. So in family life, there is also shelter and it's an opportunity to progress. Many great sages were also in the, they're also in the Grihasta Ashram. Lord Shiva is a Grihasta. Lord Brahma is a Grihasta. Lord Vishnu is a Grihasta. They, they, they all have the Swayambhu, Narada, Narada he's a Brahmachari. Right? Swayambhu Brahma, Na Narada Shambhu, Lord Shiva, Grihasta. Swayambhu Narada Shambhu, Komar Kapil Kapilomanu. Komara and Kapila, they're brahmacharis. Manu, Grihasta. Pralado Janako Bhishma. Pralad Maharaj, he's Grihasta. Janak Maharaj, he's Grihasta. Bhishma, he's brahmachari. And then Bali, Bali Maharaj, Grihasta, Vayasaki means Sukadeva Goswami, Brahmachari, and Vayam, Lord Yamaraj, Grihasta. So you can see from the Mahajans, many are also Grihasta. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he married twice before he took sannyas. And the, the many of the associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they were also in family life. Lord Nityananda was in family life. And similarly, Advaita Acharya was also in family life. Srivas Pandit was in family life. Many of the great devotees who were all intimately connected with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they were in family life. They were not Grihamedis. They were Grihastas of the highest order. They were dedicated to spirituality, although they were family men. So we should understand properly what is the position and try to understand. Of course, if you can remain brahmachari, that's very good. You don't have to get married. You can also stay brahmachari. And later on, you can also become sannyasi. Later on, you can renounce everything if you want. That, that kind of life is not for everyone. Generally, most people, they move into the family life. And the, but family life is also not eternal. Then there is vanaprast. Then there is retired life, you see. Actually, scriptures say from the age of 50, you have to detach. You have to prepare. Prepare for the next life. If you can get the good start to life, then it's much easier. Prahlad Maharaj said, Komar Acharit Pragno Dharmam Bhagavatam. From the age of five, you should begin to cultivate Krishna consciousness. Right? The age of five. What is your age? 
Oh, you're already too old. <laughs> right? What is... Nine. Nine. Well, you're also late. <laughs> you should have been five, right? We have to get five years old, right? Five year old, you can begin to cultivate spiritual life. From You get the good start, just like you get the good education. You start in the beginning, then it's not so bad. Because you've already trained yourself in the beginning. So this is the point. So youth, very important. That is why we give so much care for the youth, to get them while people are young, they can train better. Just like playing madangas. If they learn when they're young men, young boys, they learn very quickly. Very, hands are very flexible. But as you get older, <laughs> the hands become more stiff, you know. You don't learn so fast. But when you're young, you can learn quick. And so, this is the importance of the youth making a taking advantage of the early ages the young age to learn krishna consciousness because that will be very valuable later in life and prabhupada did that too when prabhupada was a young boy he learned everything he was doing rathiatra festival he was playing madanga he was doing <laughs> doing everything so like that, we encourage all of you, also become very nice devotees, follow the example of Srila Prabhupada. We say, Mahajano Yenagata Sapanta, follow in the footsteps of the great souls. Just follow that example, you know, try to be Krishna conscious, cultivating consciousness of Krishna. All right, are there any questions? Anybody? You want to ask some questions? You agree everything I say? Yeah? Yes. Okay, very good. Shave them up. Cut the hair. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you all dotis. <laughs> Okay, no questions? <laughs> yes, Prabhu? Um, very senior devotees and sannyasis are, uh, wherever they go, they are respected very much. They, they are, everybody uh, pay obeisance to them. So, uh, is there anything, uh, the sannyasis or very senior devotees, uh, they feel that I am such a personality so that everybody is, uh, Paying obeisance to me, everybody is treating me as equal to as God. Is is there any such type of thing which makes them proud, feel feel proud? So how did sannyasis or senior devotees take take such things? Well, first of all, let me tell you that it's not true that wherever you go, sannyasis are respected. You know, you come with me to China. <laughs> <laughs> or even Hong Kong or Russia or these places anywhere outside of India you'll see for yourself what is the situation so what you're saying may be true in some places but it's not true everywhere and even in India there are parts of India where people won't have so much respect for sannyasis. But maybe here in Hyderabad, among the Hindu people, they give respect. But if you go to places which are predominantly Christian or Muslim or like that, they won't respect you. It's only among the Hindu community they may know to give respect. But we should understand that when they give respect, the respect is not to the person, but it's to what he represents. Just like a young man 
and he took sannyas from Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada gave him the sannyas danda and so on and so the man went off and a little later the man came back and he said to Srila Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, I don't like this. He said, wherever I go, everybody's bowing down to me. They're all offering respects to me. And Prabhupada looked at him and said, they're not bowing to you. They're bowing to what you represent. So that is the point. You have to understand that when people offer respect to the sannyasis, it's not to that particular person, but it's to what they represent. Because they rep they're representative of renunciation. Right? The sannyas order of life is a vow of renunciation. So people are taught to respect that vow of renunciation. Hmm? So don't be jealous. <laughs> In the future, you can also become a sannyasi. We'll let you also. <laughs> and we'll send you also to Russia and China. <laughs> and tell me how you like it. <laughs> Questions? Yes, Prabhu? Can you tell a little bit about the importance of reading Prabhupada's books regularly? The importance of reading Srila Prabhupada's books regularly? Yes, it's very important for all of us. We need to read regularly because that is how we can associate with Srila Prabhupada. Even when I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement, we were not given so much opportunity to associate directly with Srila Prabhupada. You know, I was a young person and Srila Prabhupada was very much elder and senior and I was very new, I didn't know anything and Prabhupada was a Paramahansa, Paribracharya. So, you know, I didn't really have a lot to say to Prabhupada, but I liked to hear his classes. So I would go to his classes and hear his classes. And when Prabhupada would go, then we would read Prabhupada's books. And after Prabhupada departed from the world, then we understood more the importance of Prabhupada's books. So long as Prabhupada was present, we give all, all the importance to Prabhupada's vapu. But after Prabhupada left the world, we thought much more about the vani. And of the two, the vani and the vapu, the vani is much more important. Because the vani, the instruction, that is eternal. The vapu, the physical form of the teacher, that is not eternal. But the instructions, that, and that Vani is there in his books. So we give tremendous importance on Prabhupada's books. And we have to read them regularly. Every day we are reciting the ten offenses and chanting the holy name. The fourth offense is to blaspheme the Vedic literature and literature in pursuance of the Vedic version. So we should understand if we are not reading the books regularly, then that is an offense. We're not giving proper respect to the Vedic literatures because we're neglecting to read them regularly. So we encourage devotees, always keep a book with you. Wherever you go, Keep a book with you, in your bag or in your somewhere, you know, keep one in your desk or it, it, of course in your home, you should have many books, 
But you want to keep Prabhupada's books around you so that any time you can pick them up and you can read them and go through them. Very important for us. Because the, whenever we open Prabhupada's book, then we're immediately reminded of Prabhupada. And by associating with a great soul, like, like Srila Prabhupada, when we associate with him, then it opens the doors to liberation. From that, from that association, we become qualified much more to take up devotional service and to go back to Godhead, to get out from this material world. Yes, Prabhu? Maharaj, this question is not from today's class, but this question is generalized. So many times we go out and we go out for distribution of books. So when we, when we distribute books, we ask some donation. So people misunderstand us and they give some, like, if we ask, they, they think that we are doing business out of it. So how, of course we reply, we try to convince them, but many times we don't, we are not able to convince them. So if like he is uh, he's asking your uh, suggestion, so how can we give the most appropriate answer for them? Well, we can explain to them simply that we are servants of Krishna. We are representing, we are not asking the money for ourselves. If they want to give donation, if they want to contribute for the Krishna consciousness movement, it is directly service to Krishna. We are not eager for the mo their money for our own pocket. You can explain to them that you don't, you are simply a, a volunteer worker on behalf of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. So if they contribute for the service of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, it will be very beneficial for them. The benefit will be that they get the benefit of contributing to Lord Krishna. Actually, all the money which they have, it all belongs to Lord Krishna. Just like when Ravana kidnapped Sita. So Ravana took Mother Sita over to Lanka and when Lord Ramachandra heard how Mother Sita was being held captive in Lanka, then Lord Ramachandra looked across the ocean and he looked in great anger at the ocean and the ocean began to heat and all the different creatures in the ocean they were all affected because the water became so hot simply because of the anger of Lord Ramachandra. Why was Lord Ramachandra so angry? Because this Ravan had kidnapped Mother Sita. So the same way, so many Ravana-like people have taken the wealth of Lord Ram. There's so many Ravans. There was one Ravana then. Today there's many little Ravanas <laughs> and they've all kidnapped some portion of Sita. They're all enjoying the goddess of fortune, the wealth of the goddess of fortune. And so they're duty bound to return it to Lord Rama for the service of Lord Ram. Actually we say from the Bhagavad Gita also, everything belongs to Krishna. Krishna is the supreme proprietor and he is the supreme enjoyer. But he is also our best friend. So we should feel fortunate to have such a nice friend as Lord Krishna. You give everything to Krishna, you're never the loser. And whatever people give to Krishna, it will come back many times. Just like in the material world, if we give charity to an ordinary person, it will come back an equal amount in the future. So if you give charity to a brahmana, it will come back ten times the amount. And if you give charity to a pure Vaishnava, it will come back a hundred times. 
And if you give charity to the Supreme Lord Krishna, if you return everything to the Supreme Lord Krishna, it will come back an unlimited amount of times. So there's no loss giving to Krishna. Rather, you're the most fortunate person because you're having an opportunity to offer some of your hard-earned money for the service of Krishna. It's all Krishna's wealth. But we've stolen it. We've taken it. We're not recognizing him. And so, we've come to invite people to take part in this Krishna consciousness movement. So you can ask them, if you give some donation, it's for your great benefit. And we are giving you also book. So you should take the book and read the book and give donation. You're very happy, you should be happy to give donation to Krishna. This is charity in the mode of goodness. There is charity in the mode of passion, charity in the mode of ignorance. But charity for the Krishna consciousness movement is charity in the mode of goodness. It's the highest charity. Charity in the mode of passion, you do it to get some benefit for yourself. Charity in the mode of ignorance, you give to an unqualified person who is going to take the money to do some foolish activity, maybe buy alcohol or cigarettes or something. But if you give charity to the Krishna consciousness movement, that's the highest charity. That's the mode of goodness, the greatest benefit. So you have to explain, you can show them, you open the Bhagavad Gita and you read to them about charity in the mode. It's there, I think it's chapter uh, 17, it describes about charity in the, or maybe chapter 18, is it? So anyway, I'll tell you later, seven, chapter 17 I think, charity in the modes. You open the book to them and say, look, read this, read charity in the modes. And then they can understand, they're getting the greatest benefit. It's not easy. These devotees are working very hard every day to go out in Hyderabad to distribute Prabhupada's books. And they're doing wonderfully. They're distributing many copies every day. But it's not easy. Not everybody is so friendly and favorable. Many people are unfavorable and antagonistic and they complain. Oh, you people, you only come here, you only always want money and like this. <laughs> they have so many complaints. You cannot please everyone. Our business is to please Krishna. Please Krishna. That is success. <coughs> Srila Prabhupada's time also, people also used to complain. Prabhupada did not care. He said, the dogs may bark, <laughs> but the camel, the, camels, the camel drive goes on. We don't care about the barking dogs. People complaining, you know. So we're trying to please, we try to please people. We invite them, come to the temple, come and see for yourself. Come and see how we live, see what we're doing. This movement is authorized. It's fully registered, it's, it's, the accounts are audited every year. It's a registered charity. So everything is done properly, but there's nobody making big salaries, we're, we're all living 
simple. Just like Mahatma Gandhi's time, right? Mahatma Gandhi, Roti Ka Primakan, right? And so there's Krishna consciousness like that. Prabhupada was a follower of Gandhi before he met his spiritual teacher. And so Krishna consciousness is like that. You get Roti, Kapri, right? You got your Kapri and Makan. Yeah. <laughs> right? we got you need more? You don't need any more, right? Everything is there. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu? Oh, uh, like, normally we can see people all over the world, across the coming year, for spirituality, and we, being Indians, we feel fashionable and updated that we work for US companies or US companies, mainly in night shift. So, you can see from recently, one year or two years, there's COVID and also a lot of inflation, and a lot of countries are going into bankruptcy. So, in these days, being here, uh, what, how, what, what is the best option to follow spirituality after that? Take care of like parents and be, be in the stuff. Like survival, survival is a bit tough these days. Like there are a lot of low salaries and a lot of inflation taxes are going. Yes, but we have to understand yeah, that there are difficulties not only for you, for everyone. Let's say all over the world, people are facing problems. Uh, economy is down, struggle to survive, unemployment more and more, business is not so good because of the COVID and like that. Yeah, we have to accept these problems. It, it, it's so you're lucky you're not in Ukraine, right? <laughs> Look at Ukraine. You know, so you're complaining, but what about people from Ukraine? So, yes, there, we have to understand material world, that this is the way of the material world. A real business, don't come back, don't plan to stay here, you know. Understand it is difficult here. And so we need to give some priority to spiritual culture, cultivate Krishna consciousness. No, we're, we encourage everyone. If you can work for Krishna, okay, very good. Somehow you're able to do some work for Krishna, that's eternal benefit. But life is going to be temporary. We won't, we're not here forever. Where are you going to go in the next life? We have to think about that. And you help your parents, yeah, you help your parents at the same time. We know they have a material body also. We've had many parents, many lives. Every life we have different parents. Now also you have parents. Now you take care of them. But your duty to them is also should be also to help them to cultivate some spiritual consciousness. Right? Don't cook meat for them. Don't give them chicken. Right? Keep, make them devotees. Tell them about Krishna. Get them to eat prasadam. Very important. So, you have a duty as a son. You're the putra. Putra means the one who saves the father from going to hell. The planet put. This is the son, the real son. So you have to save your father like that from going to the inauspicious destination. So try to understand how you can do that. Give them Krishna consciousness. Devotional what? Movement. Moments. 
Well, you can read all those things in the Lilamrita Prabhupada's pastimes. Like I said, you know, I was not so close to Prabhupada. Prabhupada had many disciples. You know, I wasn't, I'm not a very important disciple or anything. I was not very close to Prabhupada. But, uh, Prabhupada taught us to how to dedicate everything for Krishna. Just do, Prabhupada wanted us to also be happy in Krishna consciousness. He said, if I have done anything, I have given a better life for so many people. And so he wanted us to be happy in Krishna consciousness. Hmm. We were, we were with Prabhupada one morning in the park in London and the policeman was kicking some man. There was some man in the park sleeping. So the policeman came and kicked him. Get up. You know? In England they don't let you sleep in the park in the night. You know? So they, the policeman kicked the man to get up. And Prabhupada saw and Prabhupada said, see? He said, the young man has a home but he is sleeping in the park. He said, this is Kali Yuga. He said, he has a home, but he doesn't go home. Instead, he's sleeping in the park, and the policeman is coming and kicking. He said, this is, this is the material world. So much suffering. You're meant, to be, you're meant to simply live comfortably, peacefully, but somehow, due to the nature of this Kali Yuga, People cannot be comfortable. They come and sleep in the park and they get kicked by the policeman. So Prabhupada told the story about Lord Shiva. He said Lord Shiva was with his wife one day and they were approached by a beggar. The beggar was asking, you know, give something, give me something. So Parvati said, she felt some pain. She said, we should help him, give something. So Lord Shiva said, if I give him something, what good will it be? It won't do any good. So Lord Shiva, he took a papaya and he put some jewels in the papaya. And then he gave the papaya to the beggar. The beggar didn't know there were jewels inside the papaya. So beggar took the papaya and sold the papaya for a few paisa. <laughs> <coughs> so, so Lord Shiva said to his wife, you see? He said, he can't change his karma. This was the karma that they're meant to suffer like that. <laughs> so the same way, people are suffering. Prabhupada was on the train. Beggar came. So Prabhupada took, took a, a rupee or something, gave him a rupee, and the beggar went, huh? One rupee. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, you're a beggar. <laughs> so, Prabhupada is very practical, you know. We got initiation. When we got initiation from Prabhupada, we were quite a few of us, we were about, there was about 18 of us, we got initiation in London. And so after we got initiation, Prabhupada called the temple president and he said to the temple president, he said, you know, I have initiated all these young men here today. He said, none of them give me any Guru Dakshin. <laughs> And the temple president said, Prabhupada, they don't have any money. <laughs> they don't have any money. So, <coughs> Prabhupada said, mm, just see. <laughs> England, supposed to be <laughs> rich country, very poor. Nobody has any money. He said, finished. So, anyway, we all went on Sankirtan and we collected some money on Sankirtan and we gave that to Prabhupada. So Prabhupada didn't mind so much that we took initiation and didn't have any money to give him Guru Dakshin. 
He said, anyway, you're giving your whole life for Krishna. He said, that's the main thing. If you give your whole life to Krishna, then it's all right. want to give your life to serve Prabhupada, Prabhupada's mission. Okay, Hare Krishna, thank you very much.